to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Pee Wee Valley Baptist Church in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of Psalms. This morning, we're going to talk about prayer. Prayer. Um, and uh, maybe a part of prayer that doesn't sit well with us, a part of prayer that we often perhaps don't think about, uh, 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 the aspects of prayer that are so critically important, uh, even in the issuance of those prayers. And uh, we're going to find uh, these truths in the sixth psalm, Psalm 6, if you will. If you'll turn to the sixth psalm, Uh, Then we'll begin uh, reading in just a second, give you a moment to get there. And uh, and then if you're able, please stand and uh, follow along at the reading of God's Word here in these 10 verses that comprise Psalm 6. Beginning with the first verse, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee in hell. Who shall give thee thanks? Uh, The grave there in verse 5, I'm sorry. Verse 6, I am weary with my groaning all the night. Uh, make I my bed to swim. The, uh, I, I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. For the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. Father, we thank you for your word, how precious it is uh, to us. And Lord, as we examine this portion of your word this morning, we pray that you would feed us uh, from the truths that you have herein for us, individually and collectively. May we not uh, treat this as uh, something that's unimportant, but may it be something that uh, we consider to be critically important essential in our lives, this issue around prayer, which we'll examine today. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. So I've titled today's message, Selfless Prayer. Selfless Prayer. Um, And I wrote down uh, three questions uh, that we can ask ourselves about prayer before we actually get into the text. Uh, When we end today, we're going to take a look at three principles uh, regarding prayer that will deal with these questions. But uh, as, we, as we examine this psalm today and we look at this topic, uh, selfless prayer, there's a couple of things that we should consider. The first question that I ask is, uh, what do we really want? When we pray, what is it that we really want? Second question is, when we pray, is uh, what are we trying to avoid? Sometimes it's what we want. Sometimes it's what we want to get away from. So what is it we're trying to avoid? Uh, Or maybe to get out of. The third question I ask is, what does success look like in our prayers? What does success look like? What is our objective? What is our goal? What's the purpose of our prayer? And then what would, what would uh, uh, an appropriate answer or resolution to our prayer look like that we might call success? So think, those, think about those things and consider them in light of what we'll study today. What do we really want? What are we trying to avoid? And what does success look like? So in these first um, few verses, um, I'm just going to state the problem. We usually have a problem. That's why we pray. Uh, Too many times. We shouldn't be praying just because there's a problem. But every time we pray, we should understand that there's a need 
And from that sense, there's a problem. Even if we want to praise the Lord in our prayer, there's some problem that brought us there typically. Maybe the problem is we haven't praised him enough. But whatever the problem is, now in this psalm, uh, a psalm of David, uh, there was a real problem here. And I believe that all of us can relate to the problem that David had. Uh, and it particularly concerned his health uh, and uh, it concerned those around him as he was consciously aware. Now, we got to understand that David was a king. He was the king of Israel. And as being the king, there were people that opposed his leadership. Uh, there were people, and we studied about that, and we looked at an earlier psalm. There were, there were people that didn't want him on the throne. Uh, and so there were people who tried to dethrone him, to kill him, and to get rid of him. And so we find David in that sort of a state. But in addition to the, the pressure of the people around him and the pressure of the responsibilities for the administrative duties of being a king and all the people problems that go along with that and all the other national problems that he was facing, uh, David had health issues as well. And we see that in this psalm. And if we take a look first at the second verse in this psalm, we get a little close to what the problem is. In verse 2, David says here, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. What we see here is extreme physical pain. You ever have physical pain? There are people in this room today who are is experiencing a lot of pain. They are resisting that pain, ignoring that pain, bearing that pain just to be here today. Uh, there are people who are not here among our number who have too much pain to be here today. And there are other periods in our life when we have more pain than we do today. Some people sort of work through it, but David was in a situation where it wasn't debilitating pain, but it was that which was very uh, extreme, if you will. And we see that in this verse. He characterizes that through um, the, the fact of his, his agonizing in pain. This word vexed at the end of verse 2 talks about being troubled and, and hints at agony. It brings that, that sense of agony that David, and we, we take the psalm in whole as we've read it, we understand he was agonizing in pain. He had extreme physical pain here uh, to the point that his pain actually caused him to be weak. It says, have mercy upon me, Lord, for I am weak. Have you ever had so much pain and you just don't feel like doing anything? Your body just feels like it can't go anymore. It's a real struggle to try to, to move and to go and to do the things that you, you feel you need to do in the course of a day. Maybe even to prepare your food or to, or, or to run errands. Whatever it might be, the chores that you have from, um, from morning till night. Uh, David experienced this weakness, and he was looking for relief. We see that in the first part of the verse. He says, have mercy upon me, O Lord. Have mercy. So he's asking. So we see the problem is he's got this excruciating pain. Uh, seemingly, there doesn't appear to be any relief on the horizon, we see that in another portion of the scripture, and, and he's crying out to God for relief from this ailment and from the pain associated with the ailment. Literally, he was in pain. This is the problem that he had. Now, if we look at verse 1, we see why he had the problem. This is a place where most of us don't bother going. But David was a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 14, 13, David was a man after God's own heart. We understand that when he went out against Goliath. Because he wasn't going out in order to gain fame and glory for himself. And a lot of that came along because of what he did. But it wasn't, it wasn't him that, that, that was victorious over Goliath. And the army of the Philistines. It was, it was a willing vessel of God who looked at the situation 
and decided somebody's got to do something because this is God's army that Goliath and the Philistines are threatening. Somebody's got to do something. And he saw his fellow countrymen not doing anything. So he went out. He went out. They tried to put armor on him. Everybody was joking and laughing about him not being a warrior. But he had a cause. He had a cause. And one of the problems is that sometimes when we, when we pray, we selfishly think about ourselves instead of thinking about the Lord. David went out against Goliath because, not because he wanted to get victory, not because there was something in it for him, but because it was God who was being accused. It was God who was being attacked. It was God who was being shamed by this pagan army of, of giants, if you will. But here we find somewhere where we don't want to go all too often. In the first verse, he says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. There's two words here that give us a very clear indication of why David was in all this pain. The first of those words is rebuke. The Lord was rebuking him. Secondly, we see that the Lord was chastening him. The word chasten means discipline. The Lord was disciplining him. There's some sin in his life, and the Lord was disciplining him for that sin. David understood that. And that's why he cries out, Lord, uh, rebuke me not in thine anger. In other words, he accepted the discipline, but David being a man after God's own heart, knew what God is capable of doing. When God's fury and His wrath and His anger come in full fury, what happens? <laughs> it's very destructive. Though David knew that he was at the mercy of God for this sin, he wasn't saying, don't discipline me, but he's saying, don't let it be in your anger and at the end of the verse he intensifies that request because he knows this hot displeasure which is real fury and wrath of God could be poured out on him and so he asked God to be merciful and not to not to discipline me that severely David was in pain he was in pain he understood why he was in pain most of us when we are in pain, when we have a malady of some kind, we have this illness, uh, regardless of how severe or slight it might be, we're so intensely focused on trying to get rid of the pain, to get rid of the problem, that we don't ever bother looking to see why we're in this pickle to start with. Why am I here? David understood it. In fact, it's the first thing in the psalm. Lord, you're rebuking me and chastening me. And it appears that this is very serious because it, it, from my perspective, your anger and your hot displeasure has come against me because of sin in my life. Lord, I need mercy. He said, rebuke me not in your anger and chasten me not in your hot displeasure. Yeah, he was... He was seriously ill, and he knew why he was ill. He knew why he was in all this pain. And even knew why he was in trouble. Because we understand, those of us who were studying here on Wednesday nights, we went through the books of 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, but we saw in the life of David in the process of that, and how that David, because he had committed the sin of adultery, and because he had tried to cover that up, and he used a murder to do that, that God said he would bring evil upon his house. And boy, did God pour out evil upon his house. David understood sin was the problem here. Sin was the problem. And because of that sin, God was rebuking him and chastening him to the point where it appeared his anger and his fury were being poured out on him. And he's pleading to God for mercy. So in the third verse... We see this intense frustration by David. He says, my soul 
is also sore or very vexed. The word vexed again means troubled. My soul, the very essence of my being. You ever get to the point where the pain and the, and the circumstances and the situation that we're, that we're in, when it comes to the point where it's almost debilitating and we feel like our very existence is even at risk now. David felt that way. He says, my soul is very troubled, but thou, O Lord, thou, O Lord, how long? How long? This had been going on for some time, evidently. And David didn't see a light at the end of the tunnel. Have we ever been in those circumstances? It seems like there's no end. We get, we get these uh, illnesses or pains that come and they go fairly quickly. And then there are those that come and they linger day after day and week after week. And it seems like there's not relief available. Despite the fact that we go to physicians and we get medications and we go through rehab and we go through periods of inactivity and uh, in, in, in trying to rehab ourselves, we, we get to the point sometimes where there's no relief. And it may even be, it may even be that the lack of relief may be because we've never addressed the sin that's, that's been the reason why God is chastening and rebuking us. When we're trying to seek the doctor for all the answers. And then we start blaming the doctor because he couldn't fix it. The doctor, she couldn't prescribe the right medication. The doctor couldn't do this. I'm not able to do that. And we start blaming it on all these other things. Do you ever think about looking at ourselves to see why perhaps the, the, the problem is there to start with? Maybe it is sin in our life. It was for David here, and he recognizes that, and he admits it, and he wrote it down in a book called the Bible where for eternity that stands out as truth. Sometimes you don't want other people to know. Think David had a problem with that? Didn't have a problem with it. Sometimes I wonder why we have such a problem with, with, you know, confessing our sins to others. It's a kind of a healthy thing to do, according to the scriptures. We have a problem with that because we don't want anybody to think that we've ever sinned. But the Bible says we all sin. Even after we're saved by the grace of God, we still sin. But we don't want. So we would never write it down in a journal for anybody to see it. Sometimes we don't even bother introspectively looking at ourselves to determine, in fact, that's the case. But David did, and he had this intense frustration and seemingly no end in sight. And so skip down to verse 6. We see now that his, his pain actually got to the point where he was suffering intensely. In verse 6 it says, I am weary. Literally, literally I'm worn out because of the pain. Have you ever had pain? And sorrow to the point that you just feel like you're wasted, worn out. I'm weary. He was literally wearied with what? With groaning. It's that, it's, it's, it's the groaning, those things that can't even be uttered. It's just a, uh, you know, you, you, you go to get up out of the chair. You ever do one of those things? Uh, right? You go to bend over to pick something up and you're wondering what else can I do while I'm down there because I don't want to do this very often, Right? And David was to the point where he's actually weary because of it, and he's groaning uh, daily. And he says in the end of verse 6, All the night make I my bed to swim because of his tears. Making his bed to swim literally uh, is, a, is a figurative way of saying, I have been in many tears over this thing, and it seems like the number of tears that I've shed about this thing are enough to make my bed float. And then at the very last phrase in verse 6, he says, I water my couch with tears. He's crying night and day because of the pain. And he's groaning. And some of us have been to the point where we understand this kind of pain, this kind of sorrow, this kind of grief, this kind of dark circumstances in our life. It just seems to get the best of us. We don't even bother looking for the source. David did. He acknowledged it. Look at verse 7. Not only this, but even at the point he writes it, his strength was failing and he was growing weaker. Verse 7, he says, Mine eye is consumed 
because of grief. It's even affecting his senses, like vision. Um, and he says, it waxeth. That means it grows old because of all mine enemies. So why was David concerned about his enemies here? His health was deteriorating. It seemed to be that he had much sorrow over this thing. And it had peaked at this point in time. His pain, his sorrow, his weariness, his lack of being able to see relief any time in the near future. After you've been through this for so long, you don't see relief. You don't feel relief coming. But he was current. He now brings up his enemies. Why is he concerned about his enemies? Think about it. David's a man after God's own heart. The, the equivalent for us today, we're people of faith. We've been saved by the grace of God because we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. And having done that, we necessarily are a witness and a testimony. And so the world out there knows who we are as we share our testimony, as we share our uh, relationship with the Lord, and they look at us and they got a micro they got a uh, microscope on us and they got a magnifying glass on us examining what we're doing and when we are failing miserably it appears because of our health because of things in general they look at us and say well where's his god now where's her lord that she brags on so much so it does have an effect david was so consciously aware of this problem he had this issue that he had, that he saw it as becoming that which would cause a scene um, uh, um, among the people around him that they might think that, <clears throat> so this is God's child? This is what God's child gets? And, and so he, he wasn't focused so much on himself as he was about the image or the perception that other people were getting because of this. Because... He was, going to, he was thought he was being perceived as an instrument of God's wrath, if you will, and his chastening, and the people would consider him as wrong and his, his adversaries as being right. Much like the same as he viewed Goliath, that if Goliath is victorious here, God's people look like fools. And so he, the issue is not so much his health, but it appears, Lord, that I'm a defeated person and, and I'm, not, I'm not the champion that I should be because of your grace. And when he understood that it was sin in his life that brought this, then he felt responsible for it and he felt a need in order for God to get the victory through this thing because my enemy is now looking at me the wrong way. And he says it's growing old at the end of verse 7 because of all of my enemies. Because he was consciously aware of what was being projected outside of his own life to other lives and what they were thinking about, not just him, but what they were thinking about his God. So this was the problem that David had. So what was the purpose of his prayer? The questions we asked uh, earlier is, what do we really want? We haven't gotten to that yet. But what are we trying to avoid? We haven't got to that yet. What does success look like? That is a hint here in verses 4 to 5, the purpose of David's prayer. Why was he praying? See, if we, we're talking about selfless prayer. If we're praying selfishly, we want to get rid of the pain. We want to get rid of the sorrow. We want to get rid of the image that's being projected to our enemies. We want a better life. We want to be happier. We want health. We want all of these things. But is that really the reason why we should be praying? Look at why David was praying in verse, um, verse 4. He says, return, O Lord. It's as if the Lord has left, right? The Lord hadn't gone anywhere. But the effects on David because of God's rebuke and chastening was as if God had left him. And so he says, return. No doubt he's asking for a return of God's grace, a return of his mercy, a return of his loving kindness. And he said, return, O Lord, because we're at the mercy of God. Period. 
He says, return, O Lord, deliver my soul. The word soul here literally means life. It says, return, O Lord, deliver my soul, deliver my life. He felt his life was actually at risk at this point. So he asked for deliverance from God. He said, oh, save me. But why? For thy mercy's sake. Not for David's sake. There's a very strong uh, division between what we want and what God wants many times. And here David is not selfishly asking for his health to be restored. He's selflessly looking to the Lord. And he's saying here, save me for thy mercy's sake. Mercy is loving kindness. Because God is love. Now, we understand from First John, God is love. God is love. So the world wrongfully many times think that God is only love. Well, God, a loving God is a just God. And He's a righteous God. And God hates sin. And when, we, and when people commit sin, God justly pours out His wrath and His anger upon them. So David is the target of that because of his sin. And he's, he's in, in it's, because it's, some call this a psalm of penitence. And that is because of his contrition, because of his sorrow, because of his grief over his sin. And he is. And we see that there in verse, um, verse 1. Because of his sin, God's chastening him. And what's happening is he's looking for the love of God to come upon him and the mercy of God because David has proclaimed the mercy and the love of God. And God, having repented or turned from his sin, he looks to God for that coming again with the mercy of the grace instead of the rebuke and the chastening. And he's looking for that. That's what he wants. He wants literally to manifest God's unfailing love in his life. That God's unfailing love will be poured out upon David so then David could be a living testimony of the love of God. Because when we sin, what happens is we're a living testimony of the anger and the wrath of God. But David's asking for God, but more clearly in verse 5, literally that God would receive the praise and the thanksgiving. In verse 5 he says, For in death there is no remembrance of thee, uh, in the grave, who shall give thee thanks? What David is saying is, okay, Lord, I'm at, I'm at the point of death here. Things have been going on so long, and it just looks like it's a downward spiral. And if I go on to the grave, he's not using this as an argument to save his life, but he's using it as a plea to give thanks and praise to God. Because the end of verse 5, he says, he says, in the grave, who shall give thee thanks? In other words, David was a man after God's own heart. He did want to praise God. He wants to give God thanks. Yes, he sinned. We all sinned. But David repented of that sin. He confessed that sin. And he's asking God to spare his life. That in the sparing of his life, why? Because in the sparing of his life, he could continue to give praise and thanksgiving to God, be a witness and a testimony, and he could execute the office of the king of Israel as God desired. Because he was a man who was after God's own heart. Do we make mistakes? Yes. Do we miss the mark? Yes. Do we sin? Yes. David's desire wasn't just that his health be restored. It wasn't just that. Selfish prayer is when that's what we want. I don't want to be sick anymore. I want to avoid financial failure. I don't want this trouble in my life anymore at work. I don't want the issues in the family. I don't, want, I don't want the stigma associated with me when I go out in public anymore. I want to avoid these things. I want to be healthy. That's very selfish things. It's me, 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 me. It's a focus on me. Whatever trouble I have, whatever desire I have, I want to avoid the trouble and I want to have the good things. It's all looking at self. And in the doing of all of that, where does God fit in? Lord, I want to be healthy. Remove the sickness from me. Where's God in that prayer? It's a very selfish prayer. It's very selfish. There's a reason for our existence. 
There's a reason for it. As believers, there's a reason for our existence. And the reason for our existence is to bring glory and praise to God. Because we've been bought with a price, we're no longer our own. Since when did we get the right as Christians to have the right and the privilege to focus on ourselves and have what we want apart from God's will? We don't have any rights. Whatsoever things you do, do all for the glory of God. Is there anything wrong with good health? No. Why do we want good health? Ought to be a reason. Well, then we don't just put a tag on the end of our prayer to throw that in just so it's in there. But it's got to be heartfelt. Literally has to be in humility. With a humble heart, we go to the Lord and ask for things that would connect with him in a way that he would look favorably upon it. But David was a man after God's own heart and his public witness and testimony was at risk here. And he wanted, he wanted God's greatness to shine through him. And that would cease if he went to the grave because the man after God's own heart would no longer be able to praise him. David was truly concerned about that. This is the truth that's given to us. It's not, it's not a charade that David is pulling in order to get health. It's a, literal, it's a literal desire of David to continue a life of service to God. That's where he is. And so the last uh, three verses there I call the praise. The praise for God's um, uh, faithfulness. We've looked at the problem uh, that prompted the prayer. Uh, we looked at the purpose of the prayer. And then the promise of God's faithfulness is found in verses 8 to, to 10 here. The scripture says in verse 8, Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. Uh, that is, God has heard me. In verse 9, the Lord hath heard my supplications. The Lord will receive my prayer. So God has heard and God will receive my prayer. And in verse 10, let all mine enemies be ashamed and very troubled. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. Literally, his enemies will retreat. It's confidence that he had in God. It's real confidence. And he wanted to praise God for his faithfulness. And he does that in those last few verses. So I want to give us a couple of principles as we close for our prayer life. Based on this. Remember we asked the questions. What do we really want? What do we really want? In David's case, what he really wanted was not good health. That's not what he really wanted. What are we trying to avoid? David wasn't trying to avoid the pain and the suffering and the sorrow. And what does success look like? And success looks like the enemies of God retreat. There's the success. It has nothing to do with his illness. If we look at uh, Psalm 66 and verse 18. Turn over to Psalm 66 and verse 18. The first principle that I want to mention here is that we need to pray with purity. We must pray with purity. Three principles in prayer. We must pray for, with, with purity. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard... Uh, and that word uh, means to behold or to consider, to respect, even to approve. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. David said in his prayer, the Lord heard me. And in verse 19, it says, but verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. And so we find that if um, that iniquity or sin becomes an obstacle to prayer. So we must pray with purity of heart and mind, if you will. Now, lastly, the next two principles are in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Not only must we pray with purity, David acknowledged his sin, confessed his sin. He had contrition over his sin. Uh, and so he, he prayed with purity of heart. Secondly, we need to pray selflessly. 1 John chapter 5, look at verse 14 selflessly the way that translates in the scripture is this way in first john 5 14 and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything okay ask anything right and you shall receive now wait a minute if you ask anything there's a little parenthetical statement here 
that is so critically important according to His will. Not according to our desires. When we're sick, our desire is to be healthy. When we have financial trouble, our desire is to be wealthy. When we're in trouble, our desire is to avoid the trouble, get out of the trouble, be relieved of the trouble. That would be our personal desire outside of God's will. But if we're going to pray according to God's will, that's why I asked the question a while ago. We ask a prayer and say, Lord, heal me and make me well. I asked the question, where's God in that? He's not. We've got to find a way if we're going to have effective prayer to pray according to God's will. So in every prayer, every prayer, every prayer, God's will must be our focus. It's not a selfish look of what I want and what I desire. So in, in, the, in the same vein, we're not just going to pray when trouble comes our way because prayer is communication with God. And we're always looking to accomplish his will to do what he wants. And so we're not waiting for the prompting of prayer through trouble or through sickness. We're we're. We're looking forward to opportunities to pray that as we serve the Lord, we seek those opportunities to align with His will, to accomplish His will. It says there that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So the first principle is we must pray with purity. Second is we must pray selflessly, not according to our desires, but according to the will of God. And thirdly, we must pray expectantly expectantly look at these verses again verse 14 and this is the confidence it's con it's boldness here it has the idea of boldness we boldly approach the throne of grace because we do have purity of heart because we've confessed those sins not because we're sinless but because we've confessed our sins and god has forgiven us of those first john 1 8 and 9 so this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask according to His will, anything according to His will, He hears us, but look at verse 15. Here's our expectancy. And if we know that He hears us, and if we ask according to His will, He does hear us. With a heart that's pure, in accordance with God's will, He hears us. Here's the good news of expectancy in verse 15. And if we know that He hears us, and we do when those other two conditions are fulfilled, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. Amen. We have them. We have them. Now what happens is, people take this full expectancy, the Bible says pray believing. Well, pray believing comes with some preconditions. And that is a heart that's pure, a heart that's pure. And it also comes, as it states here, with a selfless look at accomplishing God's will. So if our heart's pure and our desire, our objective, I asked the question earlier, uh, uh, what do we really want? What we really want is to accomplish God's will. What we really want is to do God's will. What we really want is for God's will to be done in our life. That's what we really should want. And what does success look like? Success looks like this. And that is we pray according to the will of God. Whatever we ask, we know that He hears us and we have it. It says we have at the end of verse 15. It says, let's read verse 15 again and we'll close with this. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, whatever leaves nothing out. Whatever we ask, not selfishly, but selflessly. Whatever we ask, we know, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. That's effective prayer life. And it must begin with a humble heart. That's not looking for personal benefit, personal gain, personal satisfaction, personal this or personal that. All too often we're praying for things like God is a genie in the bottle. And we just say, Lord, please heal me of this. Please grant favor to this person. Please bless this person. All the while, what we should be doing is, is focusing in on what is God's will. We find God's will in His Word. 
and we find God's will and we pray according to his will with the heart that's that is free of sin because we've confessed it and God's forgiven it. The petitions that we make, we have it because of the grace of God, because of God's love. That's effective prayer. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you for this lesson on prayer. Father, uh, it's easy for us to get sidetracked and even derailed, even in the issue of prayer, uh, because in the course of time, we, we, we go away from your will, or at least without being consciously aware uh, of, of, of what success would look like in our prayer life, and we selfishly go out to ask for those things that we desire, irrespective of your will. Father, may we, may we from now on always connect our prayers to your will with a heart that's pure. And we'll thank you, Father, for the effectiveness that will come because that is how we will be able to please you and to glorify you in all that we do. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.